Welcome back. So we are making our way through Unit 4 of Humble Yourself, The Way to Greatness. And Unit 4 is Humble Yourself Before God. This is Part 1. Part 1 is about turning. Turn from your own way and turn to the Lord. So we're up to point B, which is confession of sin. Now, I don't hear a lot of talk about this in the church today, but we really should. I mean, people, as we'll discover in this unit, you know, your healing can even be tied to whether or not you are humble enough to be willing to confess your sin. We'll talk about that later. But, uh, you know, confession of sin, it's a beautiful thing. It's coming into agreement with God about what is right. Okay, so let's go back. I want to give you this picture. Adam and Eve in the garden. There's the tree of life. There's access to God, a fellowship with God, walking with God in the cool of the day, right? There's access to the tree of life, but also in the middle of the garden, there's access to this other tree, which God says you don't, you can eat all these other, from all these other trees, but don't eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Well, up until this point in the account of creation, it was God who time after time he would create something and he would say, God saw that it was good. That is good. God is the one who deems whether something is good or not. But then this tree, humans, if they were going to eat from this tree, they were reaching out to snatch for their own purposes the right to say what they thought was good and what they thought was evil. You see, so when you do something that you think is good for your own self, if it violates what God says is good, then what that call, what that's called is sin. Sin is missing the mark, missing the standard of the perfection of a holy God. You sinned. You didn't do what was good in God's sight. You did what was good in your own sight. So this goes all the way back to the beginning of mankind. But then we have to come to the place where we're able to admit, God, I'm sorry. I did what was right in my own sight. I didn't do what was right in your sight. I sinned against you and maybe even sometimes against others, depending on what the circumstance is that you're confessing your sins about. But confession of sin, it agrees with God about our true position as the created ones before the creator. Let's look at Psalm 8, verse 3 and 4. When I, w- when I look at your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars, which you have set in place, what is man that you are mindful of him and the son of man that you care for him? Like, what am I but a pile of dust that you breathed life into? Oh, you know, like... Why would God even care to spend time with us, to have fellowship with us, to guard our lives, to watch over us sovereignly? What is man? Man is nothing. Man is just like everything else that you created. What is man that you are mindful of him? And Psalm 8 goes on. I I encourage you, read Psalm 8 in your own time. We're going to keep going for the sake of time, staying focused on confession of sin. But I wanted to give that as an example of coming before the Lord should be coming in not with a, yeah, I'm giving Jesus a high five. Yep, he died on a cross, so I'm clean. I'm a son of God. Uh Uh-huh. No, it's coming to God with a, who am I? that God even gives a rip about me 
and especially for all the sins that I've committed in my life that were not in alignment with the ways of God and that violated my conscience even, but I did it anyway, or that I knew it wasn't what God wanted, but I did it anyway because it pleased myself. What, like, why would God even bother with me? What is man that you are mindful of him? And then Luke 18 also captures this. This is uh, actually Jesus telling the parable of the Pharisee and the tax collector. But it's the tax collector who had the right idea before God, isn't it? Yeah, the Pharisee was standing there justifying himself and looking down on other people, saying, oh, yes, I'm so glad that I'm not like other people. I'm so glad that I'm so righteous. I'm so glad that I'm so wonderful and awesome because I have the favor of God, and I tell myself that every morning. But I'm not like this pathetic tax collector. Look at him. But Luke 18, verse 13. The tax collector, standing far off, would not even lift up his eyes to heaven, but beat his breast, saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. Not saying, God, pour out your wonderfulness on me because I'm so wonderful. But no, God, I'm here and I'm asking for your mercy that I know I don't deserve because I know that I have sinned against you. And frankly, that's not even specific confession of sin. That's just, in general, I know that I am a sin-producing machine. Be merciful to me. I am a sin-producing machine. Be merciful to me, a sinner. So confession of sin, it also identifies sin as sin. You know, God is always right. I don't know if you've figured that out yet, but I'm, I, I try to be right. I really try to keep my mouth shut until I can say something that is right, but I'm still growing and learning and God is still changing my mind about things and I want him to continue to do so. But God, he's always right. He's never wrong. He's always right. And confession of sin, identifying sin as sin, is saying, God, you're right. That was wrong. You're right that that was wrong. Confession is admitting that we have done something that is wrong in God's sight, that we have violated God's ways, which are right, that we have been selfish, that we have fallen short of God's perfect standard, which is right. Confession is also the way that we begin to seek the Lord for his mercy and forgiveness that no one else can give us. No one else can wash away our sins. Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Nothing but the Lord. No one but the Lord can grant us the mercy and the forgiveness for our sins that only God can give. But let's look at a few examples of this. The Psalms are rich with these types of passages. We're going to look, this is obviously, it's if you know your Bible, this is the most obvious one. But Psalm 51. Psalm 51 was written after the incident between David and Bathsheba. David committed adultery. He, He saw another man's wife beckoned her. He was king of Israel. There's a possibility that he may have even uh, pressured her into having sex with him because what was she supposed to do? He was the king. And she, you know, what was she supposed to resist? The king's advances? How exactly would that have worked out for her? You know, so David had violated God's way He had committed adultery with another man's wife, and then also he set the man up to be killed in battle when the man wouldn't comply with David's cover-up scheme. 
David tried to get him to sleep with his wife because Bathsheba got pregnant, so David was trying to cover it all up by getting Uriah, her husband, to go sleep with her so it would just all disappear and wash it under the rug. But God saw it all. God saw it all, all of it. And God sent in a prophet to confront David, say, you have sinned. This is not good. What you have done is not good in the sight of God. And so Psalm 51, starting with verse 1, a psalm of David, when Nathan the prophet went to him after he had gone in to Bathsheba, David says, Have mercy on me, O God, according to your steadfast love, according to your abundant mercy, blot out my transgressions. Do you see that? He's not saying, well, you know, like I'm king of Israel and I do a lot of other things right. You know, like I'm a good person. I hear that one a lot. When someone is caught in a sin where they have clearly done something wrong, they'll say, well, but I'm a good person. I mean, look at all these other things I'm doing. Nope. There's none of that with real confession of sin. David is saying, I I don't deserve your mercy. And the only way that you're going to show mercy to me for the wrong that I have done is because of your love and your character of love and mercy. He's saying, blot out my transgressions. Let them not appear before you. He says, wash me thoroughly from my iniquity. Iniquity is all the way to the heart. He's saying, get this out of me. Get this out of my heart. How was I even able to commit such an offense against you? Cleanse me, not only of the act itself, the transgression, the violation of your ways. Get it off of my record before you, but wash me in my inner man. Cleanse me deep in my heart from what caused me to even do it in the first place. He says, cleanse me from my sin. Cleanse me from this sin, this sinful condition that I'm in that causes me to do things that are not pleasing to you. He says, for I know my transgressions. My sin is ever before me. You know, God said to Cain, sin desires to have you, but you must rule over it. David is saying, this thing, it wants to eat me up. It's a constant battle. It's ever before me. And you know what? I slipped. And he goes on, against you, you only, I have violated your ways, God. Against you only, I have sinned. Notice he doesn't say, I sinned against Bathsheba. He doesn't say, I sinned against Uriah. That's a whole different prayer. That's a whole different confession, because those would have been true statements. But David knew, no, this is in my heart. What the, the only way that I would be able to sin against them, because guess what? God's command is love your neighbor. Oh, okay. Yeah. Adultery with another man's wife, that's not loving your neighbor. Killing a man in battle who had given his life as a soldier for you. Nope, not, nope, not loving your neighbor. So to sin against your neighbor is to sin against God. You violate the ways of God in addition to whatever damage you might do in the lives of other others. Against you and you only have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight, so that you may be justified in your words and blameless in your judgment. So, you know, we talked about this in a prior unit. Even Nebuchadnezzar, after he had been chopped down like a tree, when he came back and sent his announcement out to the whole world, his announcement was, God is right. God is right. And he knows how to humble the proud. David is saying, God is right. Yep, yep, yep. You, God, yep, I violated your way. Your way is right. My way is wrong. And I'm asking you to cleanse me of it. Don't hold this against me and cleanse me of the condition of my heart that even causes this to happen in my life. David in another Psalm, Psalm 32, starting with verse 2. And Paul quotes from this in the book of Romans. There's something so beautiful about what Jesus Christ has done for us as new covenant believers. I want you to pick up on it from Psalm 32, starting with verse 2. 
Blessed is the man against whom the Lord counts no iniquity, and in whose spirit there is no deceit. So if the Lord's not counting iniquity against you, it means that your sins have been forgiven. Verse 3, For when I kept silent, my bones wasted away through my groaning all day long. For day and night your hand was heavy upon me. My strength was dried up as by the heat of summer, Selah. Then I acknowledged my sin to you. What? Okay. So he's sick. He's he's keeping silent. He's stewing in himself. His the hand of God is heavy upon him. His strength is all dried up like the heat of summer. But it gets relief. He gets relief when he confesses his sin. I acknowledged my sin to you. Instead of keeping silent, I acknowledged my sin. Instead of pretending that nothing happened, oh, maybe God didn't see it. Instead of trying to cover it up, instead of trying to sweep it under the rug, instead of pretending to just move on, and I'm better than that, and let's just keep going. Nope. When I confessed my sin and did not cover my iniquity, I said, I will confess my transgressions to the Lord, and you forgave the iniquity of my sin. Selah. So Paul quotes this in the in the book of Romans for new covenant believers because blessed are we happy are we that Jesus Christ has died on a cross for the forgiveness of our sins as we come to him acknowledging God be merciful to me a sinner I am one who has done things that are right in my own sight not in your sight as we come confessing our need for God and our faith in Jesus Christ's atoning sacrifice, then we are the ones who are blessed because no iniquity is counted against us. Hallelujah. And God remembers our sins no more. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Psalm 38, starting with verse 1. O Lord, Rebuke me not in your anger, nor discipline me in your wrath, for your arrows have sunk into me, and your hand has come down on me. There is no soundness in my flesh because of your indignation, no health in my bones because of my sin. So do you see this? This is important. If you've got some difficult situations in your life right now, it might be because you have been unwilling to confess your sin and iniquity before the Lord. I'm not trying to be accusatory. I'm not pointing my finger at you and saying you're a sinner. I know you're a sinner. Everyone is. And the moment that you begin to be willing to admit that about yourself, your life will start to change radically and for the good. He continues, though, we're up to verse 4. For my iniquities have gone over my head. Friend, do you feel like you're in over your head? Are you in situations that you just can't even get a grip anymore? Or even your own behavior is so completely out of whack that you don't even have a grip on yourself anymore? Your iniquities have gone over your head. He continues, like a heavy burden, they are too heavy for me. If you're like, I just can't take this anymore. Life is too heavy. Life is too hard for me. David sympathizes. My wounds stink and fester because of my own foolishness. Wow, that's a confession. This is all my fault. The stinky situation that I'm in is because of my own foolishness. Now that's confessing sin. I am utterly bowed down and prostrate all the day I go about in mourning. My sides are filled with burning, and there is no soundness in my flesh. I am feeble. I am crushed. I groan because of the tumult of my heart. 
And skipping to verse 18, I confess my iniquity. I am sorry for my sin. When we get to that place, you know, I was talking to someone just the other day, and she was describing what's going on in her life. And she said, I'm crushed. If I were to put a word on it, I'm crushed. I feel like I'm being crushed. But I also know that this is a person who functions in a lot of boastful arrogance and even narcissism and is blaming everyone else for her problems and is unwilling to confess her own sin. And even when nothing but lies are coming out of her mouth, she will apologize only for her tone and her delivery, but not for the content. So she doesn't even revoke the lies that she speaks. This is a person who, until she is ready to confess her iniquity, to confess her sin and be sorry for it, she's going to continue to feel like she's in over her head and continue to feel a heavy, heavy burden on her, like she's being crushed and having wounds that stink and fester and groaning and tumult in her heart. And my heart goes out to her. But I cannot confess on her behalf. She must come to the point in her own life that she is willing to confess her own sin and that her life is in the condition that it's in because of her own sin, rebellion against God, and foolishness. Friends, who I just described, you don't know who I'm talking about, but maybe I could have been describing you. So if that's you, confess your sin. Come into agreement with God about what's right and wrong. Please, for your own benefit, you will be forgiven. Jesus Christ died on a cross, shed his blood for the forgiveness of your sins. If you will be willing to come to him, confess your sins and receive that forgiveness. Another reference to this is the prodigal son. You know, the prodigal son, he had gone off on his own way, you know, much like the woman I just described. And even though she calls upon the name of the Lord and calls God her father, she's just off on her own way. The prodigal son, yeah, he still said who his father was. But, you know, biologically speaking, of course, this is a parable. But when the prodigal son got in a real bad situation, he said, you know what? I think it's time. I need to turn around. I need to go back to my father's house. I need to go back to to the, the order that my father keeps in his house and submit myself to the ways of my father. And you know what? I, I, I've done so wrong. I've been so bad, so bad. I, I don't even, I'm not even worthy to be called his son anymore. I'm just going to go back, submit myself to the ways of my father, and offer myself as a servant, as as a slave even, right? This is Luke 15, 21. And the son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven, so I've sinned against God, and before you, and I've sinned against you. He says, I am no longer worthy to be called your son. And we know what happened. The father came out with a ring and a robe and a hug to welcome the prodigal son back home. He slaughtered the fattened calf and threw a feast of rejoicing. There is more rejoicing in heaven over one sinner who repents than over lots of people who are still saying, well, you know, I'm a good person or even over those who are walking in the way of God and have no need of repentance. Heaven rejoices at the confession of sin and the turning from it. And John the Baptist is another example of this. Mark uh, chapter 1, verse 5, All of the country of Judea and all Jerusalem were going out to John the Baptist and were being baptized by him in the Jordan River, confessing their sins. So why were they confessing their sins? Well, John's message was, repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. 
They, all Israel, was anticipating the arrival of Messiah and the day of the Lord. And we talked in a prior unit about the day of the Lord. Well, guess what? They knew if they weren't cleansed of their sins in the day of the Lord, then even though they claimed to be part of God's covenant people, they had learned from prior days of the Lord that Israel, the northern kingdom, sent into exile by Assyria. Judah, the southern kingdom, sent into exile by Babylon. Okay, those were little d day of the Lord. But if the big d day of the Lord was coming, how much more did they need to be cleansed of their sin? And friends, that applies even to us today. Jesus is coming back. Okay, the the way that they were anticipating the arrival of the Messiah, they thought Jesus was going to come that way. Jesus came a different way the first time to offer mercy through the shedding of his blood for the forgiveness of sin. But he is coming back a second time and the arrival of Messiah for the judgment of all nations and the vengeance against all enemies of God. Well, if you find yourself still in your sins because you have not confessed your sins to be washed and cleansed of them, then you will find yourselves on the wrong side of God. As Amos said, prepare to meet your God. These people were confessing their sins to be washed and cleansed. They were preparing to meet their God. And friends, I encourage you to do the same. All right, last point. So confession of sin. By calling sin what it is, calling it out, this is sin, it puts us on the path of transformation. It puts us on the path of renouncing sin. It puts us on the path of receiving forgiveness and walking in freedom from sin. You know, I was talking to someone the other day. This person is, um, they're trying to go on like a low sugar, not on a diet, but just forevermore, renouncing or, or not having a lot of sugar in their diet. And they were telling me how their body feels clean and they don't want to have a lot of sugar because their body just feels differently when they have all this sugar in it. And actually, this is a very healthy thing to do. Now, I'm not giving a health podcast, okay? So I'm not giving health advice right now. I'm just making a commentary about a conversation that I had the other day. And my response was, yes, I understand exactly what you mean, because I have, I experienced the same thing when I am fasting. You know, when you do a fast, even, you know, a shorter fast, a longer fast, when you start coming out of that fast, your body feels clean. Your body feels clean. And you're like, I don't want to put junk in my body. You know, and it's not this religious, oh, my body is the temple of the Holy Spirit, and so I only want to eat broccoli. No, it's my body is clean because I just fasted before the Lord, and my, you know, it's it's a different feeling than that. I don't want to put junk in my body. Now, yes, my body is the temple of the Holy Spirit, and that is a true thing. I'm not trying to mock, but there's a feeling in your body, if you've ever done a fast, of like, this is clean. Another analogy I would use is it's like wearing a white dress. Or if you are a man, then you would wear a white shirt, okay? You don't want to get stains on your white dress or on your white shirt. When you are walking in white, then you're like, no, I don't want to get stains on me. You're more circumspect. You're more cautious. Not in a religious way, but you want to keep yourself clean. And so as we confess our sins unto the Lord and we receive forgiveness for our sins because of the amazing, wonderful, good news of the gospel that Jesus Christ has washed us white from our sin, then once you've confessed and been washed white, my hope for you, friends, is that you will desire to continue in freedom from sin and not get your white dress dirty. Now, all of us are on the path, male or female, to be the bride of Christ. Brides of Christ wear white linen, all right? That's a biblical image. Well, if you've been cleansed to have white linen, don't mess up your linen. Start to live a life that doesn't put splotches on it by your sin. 
renounce the sin. You receive the forgiveness. You were a mess. You were like a menstrual rag. Picture that as a dress. Ew, disgusting. Okay, but now you're like a bride in a bridal gown. Keep your bridal gown clean by living a life of righteousness that is holy and doing things that are right in God's sight. Confession of sin is the beginning of getting on the path to that and really ultimately being free from sin walking in that freedom that Jesus Christ died to give us. So let's look at some scriptures. 1 John 1, verse 8. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say we have not sinned, we make him a liar, and his word is not in us. So if you say, I have no sin, or if like the woman that I referred to before, you are in sin, but you're unwilling to admit it, you are self-deceived, and you're a liar. It's just that simple. Not only are you a liar, but you're calling God a liar. Because what did we say before? God is always right. And if even Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, can say, God is right, okay? God told the truth. I didn't. God God is right. So if we say that what God calls sin is not sin, or that what God calls wrong is not wrong, or that what God calls evil, if we call it good, then we are calling God a liar. And God's not a liar. God's always right. You're not. I'm not. God's always right. You are deceived, and the one deceiving you is you. You are looking yourself in the mirror and lying to your own face if you say that you have no sin. We have to confess our sins. Jesus Christ has already paid for your sin. If you're living in this day and age, that happened 2,000 years ago. Forgiveness for your sins is readily available. All you have to do is confess them, and then the forgiveness is already there, and you are cleansed from all unrighteousness. And this goes along with Proverbs 28, verse 13. Whoever conceals his transgression will not prosper, but he who confesses and forsakes. It's not just confess, confess and forsake. So I confess that I did what was wrong in God's sight, and I'm not going to do it again. And not just confessing with your mouth that you're not going to do it again, but with your actions. Stop doing it. Don't do it anymore. The one who confesses and forsakes doing sin, doing their transgressions, they will be the ones to obtain mercy. Hallelujah. And James, he says, verse, uh, chapter 5, verse 16, therefore confess your sins to one another and pray for one another that you may be healed. The prayer of a righteous person has great power at its working. And so with that, we go back to some of the other scriptures that were listed in this class about my iniquities are over my head. I have wounds. I have sickness. I have weakness. My, I'm crushed. I'm feeble. I'm weak. Confess your sins to a fellow believer who really knows the forgiveness of Jesus, the mercy of God who won't judge you, who won't say that you are evil and and got your sins are too much for God to forgive, confess your sins one to another. Pray for one another. Through the forgiveness of your sins, you can begin to be delivered and receive your healing.